What's up, Hyperfast Nation? On this episode of the podcast, we have an amazing guest. He started off as a quartermaster in the Navy and now is a mega real estate star, wholesaled thousands of properties, taught thousands of students how to do it. He's developing dozens of properties at the same time. Welcome to the podcast, the one and only clever investor, Cody Sperber. Welcome to the show today, Cody. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I love I love the setup there. Is that is that your neighborhood in the background? Or yeah, I know those are all my rental properties back yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, you know, it for as much content and uh, training and stuff that I produce, I just thought, yeah, let's build a nice little studio. This is kind of like my my Zen garden, if you will. This is my my area of creativity where I just produce and create. Yeah. So awesome. how, how long have you been into the content creation? How, how long have you been doing this for? Oh man. Uh, well, I got into real estate about 16 and a half years ago, but in 2008 and nine, um, I was, I was like really firing on all cylinders. We were doing a ton of deals. I was down at the foreclosure auctions, like obviously Arizona melted down in 2007 and 2008. And so there was just uh, so much opportunity. And so we were down there buying anywhere between two to four houses every single day. Wow. And, uh, a lot of systems were created. I, I built an internal software that did a lot of marketing for us and helped us sell all that inventory. And people started coming to me from all around saying, how do you, how do you, how did you build such a large, whole, large wholesaling operation? How do you rehab so many houses? I think at one point we had like 30 or 40 houses going at any one point in time. And so they were just asking me systems questions and processes, and how are you dominating? And I love to teach. When I was a little kid, if you would ask me what I want to be when I grow up, history teacher was at the top mm. of that list. So I kind of always had that teaching bug. And so here I am doing great in real estate. I love real estate. I love, I'm passionate about it. I was talking about it 24-7 anyway. So uh, that's when I started Clever Investor, the education company. And uh, so many people were coming to me. I just say, hey, let's let's teach them and do it properly. And so Clever was born, and hence all the content started coming out. But it was weird because honestly, between us, like I was so bad on video, and I was so nervous to put myself on video. If you went back and watched like my first year of content, it like it's so painfully bad. But it was such an important part of the process just to have. Uh, the courage to step in front of the camera and start talking and screw up and still realize like, Oh, I'm okay. Like, you know, my business. Does, does that ever go away? Like, like if you look back a year ago from now, are you like, Oh man, I sucked. I sucked back then compared to what I can do now. Right. Cause like the more you do it, the better, the better you get at it. Yeah. I think we're all our <laughs> own harshest critics. So I, it's like leaving a voicemail and you're like, I don't sound like that. You, know, you hear your own voice, but. Uh, yeah, you know, I think people that are high performance, high performers always kind of have a pursuit of evolving. So you're going to naturally look back and say, oh, that was that, that was not very good. But um, it does. I do. I call them bits. Uh, and this is why it's so important to make video and teaching part of your core competency, um, no matter what industry you're in, especially in the real estate space. I mean, what are we doing in real estate? We're selling the dream. We're selling hope, you know, whether it's us in vet on the investing side, you know, looking towards a better, brighter future or us on the realtor side, you know, selling the dream to somebody who's going to look to move into their dream property. Uh, you got to be really confident pitching. And uh, I think video was a large part of that process for me. And um, nowadays, nobody cares about your business card. 
You know, they, your Instagram is your business card nowadays. They look you up on social to see who you are and what you're doing before they hire you, before they do business with you. So uh, I'm very glad I made, I got in front of the camera. Do it. If you're listening or watching this, do it. You're, you're, you're not as bad as you think you are. And uh, I call them bits because over time I started getting like these little like stories down as I repeatedly, you know, told them to different people. And now almost in any situation, uh, I can start, it almost feels like I'm downloading the bit and I'm able to deliver it and it feels very natural. Uh, it took a while to kind of come up with my bits, but if you look at any like great stage speaker or anybody who's out there a lot on video, trust me, they have these bits and they, the first time you hear it, you're like, wow, that's amazing. I've never heard anything so impactful, but the reality is they probably said that phrase almost like a stand-up comedian hundreds right. of times in different format for, formats to get it down so smoothly. Well, I think the other thing too, is that even if you do feel you're bad at it and you're terrible, no one, no one cares. Like you'll, and you'll get better, right? Like, so if you post it on Instagram, like the life of an Instagram post is, is like a couple hours. I think, you know, yeah. LinkedIn posts, maybe a little bit longer YouTube, maybe a little longer, like a tweet is like gone in like, 10 minutes or something the lifespan so like no one cares and most of your audience doesn't see it anyway right and like so that's why you got to keep on doing it over and over again just so people see it yeah and i think it's really important nowadays like you you're, you nailed it we have such short attention spans um now a, a great business model and one that i've been doing for a while and i a lot of really great guys that are dominating on social are doing is uh, they'll create like six, seven hours of content every week, right? So envision your business, you're gonna create six to seven hours of content in the week. And then what you do is you slice and dice up that content into dozens and dozens, if not hundreds of micro pieces of content and constantly push those out every hour or every two hours. So imagine you have a virtual assistant helping you and you go in and you record a podcast, that, that's an hour or two of content and then you record some YouTube videos or some training videos, that's another couple hours of content. You get six hours of content in one week that turns into 200 pieces of content that get posted. So it's not about the, the, the long form content when dominating social, it's about uh, creating the micro content, but mass amount of it. When, you under, when I understood that, that's when I was like, oh man, I could really dominate this game on the investing side of things. Because nobody else was really doing that. So are, you, are you batching your, your content production like a certain day or week of the month or how does, yeah, what does that look yeah. like for you? Yeah. Yeah. For, you know, for me, um, I, I am very organized with my time. It's obviously our most valuable assets that we have. And so, um, yeah, on Tuesdays and, and sometimes on Wednesdays, if I can't do it on Tuesdays, those are my content creation days. And, but I'm always a couple weeks ahead. Once you record a few weeks of content, then I started publishing it. Uh, but it gave me a runway. Uh, so even if I want to take a vacation or something like that, I'm not stressed out because I have so much content that was previously shot that hasn't come out yet. Uh, so I'm always a little bit ahead. But uh, if you look at, like, at guys like Chris Crone, I don't know if you've ever heard of Chris Crone. Yeah, yeah, I've seen him a lot on, on TikTok, actually. <laughs> That's his model, man. This yeah. is not my model. That's his model. And it's a, it's a great model right now. So if you're thinking about, all right, how do I beat other agents? Or how do I beat other investors? How do I really capture some brand and some market share? And uh, it's, it's micro content. That's it. It's not perfect content. It's a lot of content. What were you doing before you got into real estate? Uh, well, I got very lucky because when I came out of the Navy... Uh, I was going to school on the MGI bill, and that's when I fell into real estate. So real estate was by accident. It wasn't something I wanted to do. Although I will say this, when I was a little kid, um, I used to walk myself to school back back, back in the day when you walked to school. Uphill both ways in the snow, barefoot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I actually walked to school about yeah. two miles to school every day, and I would pass by this building. Um, on Baseline Road here in Mesa, Arizona. And it was the only building that had a dude's name on the side of it. And I always remembered, like I would walk by and I'd look at it and it said, Michael Polak Investments. And I always was like, 
that is the richest dude in our town. And how did he get his name on a building? Like that always made a big impression on me. So one day I stopped in there. I said, Hey, I talked to the receptionist. I said, Hey, what do you guys do here? And Oh, Michael's a developer and a real estate investor. He owns a bunch of commercial real estate. And when she said that I started, I, I made a mental note, like, wow, like rich people do real estate. So that was that first <laughs> association. And then I started noticing when I would drive down the street with my, my parents, uh, that the corner was Polak cinemas and Polak, you know, uh, promenade. And he'd had all these commercial corners, which were just strip malls and stuff like that, that he named after himself. So uh, if you look him up, his name is Michael Polak. He's kind of a super eccentric old school real estate investor, but that guy uh, definitely planted the first seed. So he um, was he was a mentor in some way, shape, or form. Maybe not on a formal basis, but like now maybe. I know him. Now now yeah. now I now I know him, and we've done stuff together and connected and do charity stuff together. But um, when I was young, no, I was he was just a, a guy that inspired me. But uh, I got out of uh, high school. I didn't know what I wanted to do, so I ended up following in my dad's footsteps, and I went into the navy. And what did what'd you do in the years? navy? Quartermaster. On, on uh, na na navigation. What ships were you uh, on? I was on the Higgins, um, which is a guided missile uh, destroyer. I was based in San Diego, but I, I'm a um, a plank owner, and that means that uh, I commissioned the ship. It was a brand new ship. I'm um, almost also a golden shellback for all you Navy guys out there. Uh, we went through the equator and the Prime Meridian at the same time, and uh, got to become a golden shellback and. Uh, yeah, lo I love the Navy experience. It was very difficult for me. I was an out of shape, kind of punk type kid that was doing a lot of drugs. And I was just, you know, smoking weed all the time. I was off on a, a bad path. A lot of my friends ended up going to juvenile hall or never really did much with their lives. A lot of drugs, a lot of um, alcohol, that kind of thing. But I, I got lucky because I went into the Navy and it disconnected me from that environment. And the Navy got me in shape. It taught me about structure. It taught me systems and the importance of systems. And uh, it just really helped me man up, I think. And so when I came out of that, I was a totally different person than, than when I went in. And uh, yeah, I was, I was uh, on submarines actually. So oh, right. I, I think, I think, you know, the Navy teaches you about teamwork, structure, discipline. I think all of that translates really well into scaling real estate. Oh yeah. Yeah. Thank you for your service. Um, it, it was the best ex and worst experience. You know, you're, you're, <laughs> you're working at, at two in the morning dying, thinking like, why did I sign myself up for this? But at the same time, I forgot about a lot of the hard times now that I think back and look back on it. And I just remember the good stuff. Yeah. Well, um, how was, how was the transition when you, when you, you know, got out and then how did you, how did you go from Navy to, you know, wholesaling and, and developing and, teaching other yeah. people about real estate. What was that? What was that transition like? Well, you know, I mean, they punch a hole in your card and they kick you out of the gate <laughs> and say sayonara. And you're like, it feels like you got out of prison. Like you don't have a lot of structure anymore. You're, you're kind of floating. And uh, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So I went back to my guidance counselor, AKA my dad. And I said, dad, what do I do with my life? I said, I think I want to be a history teacher. And he goes, well, go down and talk to some history teachers and see if you like what they have to say. And I did that. And one of the questions I asked them was, how much money do you guys make? I was talking to two <laughs> professors. And uh, the guy, one guy started laughing. And he said, man, Cody, I got a second job. And that was like, the I pumped the brakes on the history concept real quick. And then uh, uh I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. So my dad said, well, why don't you get a degree in finance? You know, just go to school, you'll figure it out. Maybe you'll go a different direction, but at, at least if you can read financial documents, you'll make it in business. And that was very sound advice. The problem was I was horrible at math. I was horrible, I'm horrible at math. Like I cannot do math at all. Like it's a blank up there. And uh, so that kind of scared me, but I hesitantly signed up because I had that MGI bill money. And while I was in school, a friend of mine named Jeremy, who I used to party with back in the day, asked me to go to lunch. And when he pulled up, he pulled up in a brand new Mercedes, like a $75,000 car. And I was like, dude, how did you get the car? And he said, man, crazy story. I flipped a house and I made 80 grand. 
and I had no money in the deal of my own. And I'm like, yeah, right. Like you're so full of it. Like I'm thinking <laughs> it's a scam. I'm thinking it's a fluke. I'm thinking like you need a bunch of money to make money. I, I had no, never heard of wholesaling real estate before. And he penciled it out on a napkin, this concept of wholesaling. And I remember I left there and I brought the napkin with me and I stared at it for like a week or two trying to figure out like what the heck he was talking about. But there was no YouTube. There was no social media. There was none of that stuff. So if you wanted to learn uh, creative real estate investing back then, you had to get on a plane and go to a seminar or wait for a guru to fly into your hometown, that kind of thing. And so I... Uh, joined my local RIA group. I flew all over the country. I did everything I could to, to learn this concept of wholesaling. And I fell in love real quick because this idea of no money down real estate shattered all of my beliefs because I thought, like I said, you needed deep pockets to do investing or rich people did investing. And uh, for nine months, I tried desperately to get a deal. Nine months. And I just picture as you're listening to this, and maybe you're somewhere in your journey where it hasn't happened for you yet. But the first month you're all excited. The second month you're 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 still talking a big game, but it's you know, you're getting a little bit more confused. And you're asking everybody, like, what should I do and how should I do it? And you're new. So you're just getting all this information and all these opinions, which makes it worse. It's like drinking from a fire hose. By month three, still no deal, four, no deal. By month five, my parents were sitting me down. Hey, Cody, you're making a mistake. Stay focused in school. Real estate's for rich people. Don't, don't. Are you do still that. in school at the time? Or yeah, doing, I'm in college. Doing both? Yeah. No, I'm just in college, you know, but I'm, I'm off on this tangent using my credit card to fly all over the country to go to these seminars and, and workshops. And, and I bought everything. I bought every course, every book, every tape. I went to all the boot camps. Like I was trying everything to figure it out. And then by the seventh month, now my girlfriend, who's now my wife, now she's laying in on me. Like, you're probably not cut out to be doing real estate. You probably need to get a job to pay off this credit card debt. Like, it's just not in your cards. Like, do something else. And so that little voice in your head grows and grows and grows. By the ninth month, I had a deal that was like right there on the finish line, but it fell apart at the last minute. And I threw in the towel. I was like, all right, I'm out real estate is not going to work for me. So I ended up quitting and I had about $32,000 in credit card debt at the time. So I uh, was walking in on campus and I saw a bulletin board with an ad for a bookkeeper that was needed. And so I went and called the person up and I, he said, come on in for an interview. And I went in for the interview and I desperately needed a job at this point. And uh, he said, hey, do you know how to do books? And I said, yeah, I can do books. And he said, great, you're hired, 32 grand a year, you start on Monday. So I, and that was on a Friday. So I left there, I went to the bookstore, I bought bookkeeping for dummies, I read it, because <laughs> I had never done books. I, I lied to the guy, I just needed a job that bad. And uh, I went and did read bookkeeping for dummies and I showed up on Monday and I taught myself how to do books and I was pretty dang good at it. You know, I got, I got pretty good at it. And, the guy that I got the job for was a real estate developer. So in my mind, even though I was quitting the business, I wasn't officially fully quitting because I was still involved in the world of real estate. But now I was just as a bookkeeper, I was part of, part of this dude's team. And for four months, I did this guy's books and he was raising private money and he was rehabbing and flipping houses. And I saw money in and money out and he was making millions. He was at scale. Uh, I think he had like maybe like 30 or 40 houses going at any one time. And uh, I was just, that was it. That's how I got into the business is, is being, trying it on my own, failing miserably, quitting, getting this job as a bookkeeper. Four months in, I'm miserable. I hate everything about my job. I hate the guy that I was working for was a, uh, just a jerk. He was so degrading towards his team members, um, treated us all like employees, like we were dispendable, yelled at us all the time. And it was the typical story, like, you know, khaki pants, a polo shirt, a cubicle and traffic. That was it. Uh, but uh, I saw the money he was making. And right around the four month mark, my wife was getting sick and tired of me complaining, or my girlfriend at the time was getting sick and tired of me complaining. And she said, uh, 
maybe you should try again and get back into it. And I was like, I tried for nine months. Like it didn't work. I, I, I'm, I'm just starting to unbury myself from all this debt that I put myself in. And my friend Zach said, Hey, want, you want to go to another seminar? And it's in San Francisco. Like this one's totally different than all the other ones that you've ever been to. And I pushed back and I was like, no, dude, I, I don't want to do that. Like I already know I don't want to do that. And so him and my wife were kind of tag teaming and working on me. And I finally agreed after about a week or two of them asking me to go to the seminar, I finally said, fine, I'll go for no other reason than just to have like a vacation with my friend, Zach. And so I reluctantly went to one more seminar. And when I walked into the room, uh, it was put on by this old timer named Jack Miller. Jack Miller, unfortunately, is has passed away now. But Jack was actually from Florida, where you were at. And he was one of the just the old time OG real estate gurus. And there was about 400 people in the room and my arm hair stood up. You ever had like a defining moment in your life or where you just knew you were at the right place at the right time? It just felt different. Yeah, you can feel it. It feels liberating. Almost. It feels liberating. And I, I, I walked in that room and I looked around and it wasn't a pitch fest. It was a deal making seminar with real people doing real deals that really cared that really wanted to help each other. And a lot of the guys that I bought books and tapes and courses from were in the audience wow. taking notes from Jack Miller. And I thought, wow, this is just wild. I can't believe this is happening. And I was really digging Jack and his storytelling and he was just a great dude. And at lunchtime, I went to the lunch break to the bar and there was this old guy sitting at the bar and, um, he had Adidas sweatpants kind of pulled up real high in those old person Velcro shoes and this wrinkly polo shirt that he washed too many times. It had like his collar all jacked up and it was tucked into his Adidas sweatpants. And we and him started talking, talking real estate, talking about life, talking about guys been doing real estate for 40 years, has done, you know, tens of millions of dollars inside his self-directed Roth, just a, just a complete beast. And his name was Lyle. And I fell in love with Lyle right there at the bar. And, and about an hour later, we're still talking. I'm like, dude, you are the, you're like Yoda of real estate. You're the coolest guy I've ever met. You need to be my mentor. I just blurted it out. And he was like, oh, you don't want me to be your mentor. I'm tough. And I'm like, <laughs> no, I want you to, I need a mentor. I tried it on my own. I, I did it the wrong way. It didn't work. And right then and there at the bar, I convinced Lyle to be my first mentor. And by convincing, I mean, I paid him and uh, uh, he gave me some rules of what it would mean to be a student of his. And it's not like he took on a lot of people, but he saw something in me and I saw something in him and it just fit. And uh, by the end of the conversation, he was my first real estate mentor. So nine months didn't work, four months quitting, doing bookkeeping. Now I have Lyle. About two months after making that deal with Lyle, that's when I did my first real estate deal. What, what were the rules that he set up as, you know, as to be his student? There, there, was, there was great rules. It was three rules, very simple rules. Rule number one is you, I, you have to pay me $10,000. He goes, look, if you're not willing to invest in yourself and you don't believe in yourself that much and you're not willing to put it all on the line, he knew I didn't have a lot of money. Uh, I, had to, I had to create the $10,000. It's not like I had it. I had to go create it and he didn't care how I created it. He was like, go get it from your dad, go borrow it, sell something of yours, sell a car, figure out what, how bad do you want this? And so 10 grand was the buy-in price. But I mean, realistically, what is that? One real estate deal? I mean, it's not much. So 10 grand was the buy-in price. Rule number two was like baseball, there was a three strike rule. And if I got three strikes, I was officially out and he kept my 10 grand and he was I was out and he was not going to mentor me anymore. Uh, and the third rule was he got to keep, I got to keep 100% of my first large deal. After that, he got to decide if I used him in any way during the deal making process. If I used his money, his credibility, his knowledge, anything, he got to decide how much of the deal he kept and how much of the deal I got right? As far as the profit sharing. So those are the three rules. And so I said, okay, cool. 
I'll, uh, I, at the time I had no deals. I had no, I mean, it's like what split, split 50% of no deals. Uh, yeah. 80% of no deals. Like it, it was like a, all, only a win for me. And, uh, he said, as long as you continue to use me as your mentor, I continue to take a piece. And so that was it. And it was a, it was a great deal for me and a great deal for him because I made that guy a fortune. Um, that first deal changed my life. Two, two months later, I got my first big deal. It was for $40,000. I got to keep all of it. Uh, it was a wild deal. Lyle helped me through the entire thing. I helped this amazing homeowner out of a really tough situation. And I got to keep $40,000 in, in the process. And with that 40 grand, it changed everything for me. That's more than a year of income as a bookkeeper. Hey, hold that thought for a minute. Do you wanna take your real estate business to the next level? If you do, there's no reason to go it alone. Learn from people who've been where you want to go. Carrie and I have sold billions of dollars in real estate. We've netted over seven figures for seven years in a row now. And we want to see if you would be a good fit to work for us. We don't work with a lot of people, but we want to give you a chance to get on a free strategy call to see if we can help you get your business to the next level. Go to hyperfastcoach.com and apply for your discovery session today. Again, that's hyperfastcoach.com. How'd you find that deal? Uh, you know what? I, I wish I could remember because I've done so many deals now, but I believe it was a postcard. I believe that's the story I tell myself now that it was a postcard. But uh, yeah, the guy was in foreclosure, bankruptcy, and going through a divorce. So it was the Damn. triple threat. Yeah, it was a really tough deal. And thankfully, I had Lyle because Lyle... Every time I ever had any deals in the beginning, I would go to Lyle. Here's the scenario. What do I do? And because of his knowledge, he always knew all of the steps that I, I was going to have to do. And that's one of the most powerful things is in real estate, you got to be able to anticipate what is happening and what's coming next. That's why self-education is so important in this industry. You go to realtor school, they're not going to teach you how to be a realtor. They're going to teach you how to fill out a contract and eth ethically work with, you know, people, but they're not going to teach you how to do business and be in a good agent or be a good investor. And so uh, that stuff, it was very important that I had him in my corner because he was telling me and teaching me the things you can't learn in books. And uh, with that money, I quit my job as a bookkeeper. I went into real estate full time. I burned the boats. It was like, I'm all in. Uh, I paid off my credit cards and stuff like that. I gave my parents some money. I bought my wife the engagement ring of her dreams, which was the big thing that I, I spent money on. And uh, yeah, I did, some, I did one nice thing for myself, a little gift for myself, and the rest is history. From that, the distance between deal zero and deal one was, I don't know, a little over a year. Then I get the big deal. About a month and a half later, I had my second deal. Then about three weeks later, I had my third deal. Then about two weeks later, I had my fourth deal. And then they just started stacking and racking because I built the pipeline. I gained the confidence. I started getting systems down. And me and Lyle were a great combo. We, uh, and he was tough on me, man. He took a lot of the profits in the beginning. A lot of the profits. How long did that uh, the mentorship last with him? A little longer than I expected. Uh, in that he expected uh, just because I started using him a little bit as a crutch because it got so comfortable. Right. He had money, he had credibility, he had the the knowledge. And I would, what I was good at, I had the youthful enthusiasm. I had the energy to go out there and pound the pavement, knock the doors and, talk, and meet and greet and do all the stuff that I needed to do in order to, uh, you know, drum up the business. He helped me close the deals. And I got really comfortable in that position. And about maybe two and a half years in, uh, I think, well, I know, he decided that our course, we had run our course. And so what he did, which was really smart, and Lyle was one of the best mentors I could have ever had because he allowed me to always discover the truth, whether it was being scared to pick up the phone and call and doing really creative things with me to overcome my fears of cold calling or, uh, making sure that I flew the nest. Uh, he just started squeezing the profits and taking more and more and more and more 
until one time he overreached and it pissed me off. And, but I didn't, I wasn't aware that he was doing it. It just kind of happened on a deal. And he said, you know what? I'm going to keep most of this deal. And I just went crazy because I was like, I found the deal. I negotiated the deal. I did the paperwork. I did everything. You barely did anything. And now you're going to take all this profit. And he was like, what are you going to do about it? You know? And finally <laughs> I, 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 I called him up after thinking about it. I'm like, Lyle, this isn't working for me anymore. I can't, I can't operate like this. You're take, you're, you're being greedy now and you're taking too much of the deal. And I just hear this. And he goes, all right, what you're telling me is uh, you're going to do this on your own. And I said, yeah, I'm going to do this on my own. He goes, congratulations. We're done. You're there. That's exactly what I needed you to, to tell me. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, dude, for the last probably eight months, I've been squeezing you on the deals to get you to jump out of the nest. And finally you woke <laughs> up and you're there. And I'm like, wait, you were doing that on purpose. And he goes every single time on purpose. And uh, it was just a great experience because now come full circle, I've gone and done thousands and thousands of transactions. And I've been lucky enough to mentor a lot of people, hundreds and hundreds of people. And I don't know very many other people out there that have created as many real estate success stories as I have, but I've taken a lot of what I learned from that style Lyle brought to the table. And I, I implement it in my own way, in my investing mentorship program and stuff like that. So it's been cool to be full circle, to go from needing Lyle to being like Lyle to becoming Lyle. How did, how did you go from you doing the wholesaling deals to scaling it? Cause I think there's a lot of great people out there that are good at wholesaling, but if it's just you, you know, it's a job, like you don't get residual income from it. Like you really have to hire people and build out systems. And, and I haven't, seen too many people outside of you and a few others really scale it and make it into a business. How did, how did you go from, you know, you Cody doing it to now there's a team yeah. of people doing it and, and you get paid when you're, you know, when you're, you're there or not there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, I took a lot, what we learned in the Navy, you know, the, the, the love of systems and processes in the Navy, they have a system for shining your shoes and a system for making your rack and a system for everything. And so, I just kind of looked at that and I said, you know what, if I ever want to be free, I got to work on the business, not in the business. So I dedicated one day a week called System Saturday. And every Saturday for about two, three years, I just worked on a couple processes on the business, documenting, automating, systematizing, delegating, whatever that was. And so I, I earlier I said something, maybe you caught it, that anticipation is power, being able to anticipate what comes next. Well, uh, leverage is also power in this business. And the people that play the game at a very high level are really good at delegating. They understand how to automate, systematize, and delegate. And uh, being young, I was always good at technology. So I, I was always kind of out of the, in front of the curve with different softwares, whether it was, I was one of the first, if not the first wholesaler in the country to use email marketing on a mass scale text message marketing, ringless voicemail marketing. You know, I was just way out in front of everybody in 2004, five, six, seven. I was doing a lot of the stuff that nobody even knew existed. And um, so working on, I, I created those SOPs. And as I hired and trained new team members, I realized that they could do it better than me. And even though I'm very, you know, most of us are very egotistical entrepreneurs, the reality is you're not that great at doing all those positions of the job. And it's really in your best interest to elevate like kind of like Michael Gerber's e-myth type where it's like, you can be the technician uh, and control everything, or you can elevate up to manager and then eventually to true entrepreneur by creating those systems. And it was the best, hardest thing I've ever went through, the best decision I made. And now a lot of people, when they come to me for training or, you know, for me to mentor them, that's what they're looking for. They're like, hey, man, just give me the, the whole model all in one. And uh, uh, the automation, in the, there's no excuse nowadays. Back in the day, I had to either create the software myself or patchwork in 20, 30 different softwares all together to like create different systems. Now with technology, 
there is everything's all in one place. All the integrations, everything's done in one place. So like, and if you looked at my business, acquisitions, dispositions, the, the, our, our rehabbing department, our raising of capital, um, all the follow-up sequences, all the in integrations, everything's one click, everything's automated. Uh, I have all my KPIs right there visually. So as the CEO, I can see everything that's going on in real time. It really is like an all-in-one investing operational system that makes it very easy for me to scale. So when you see some, I, I see people that are doing one, two, three deals a month. They're working just as hard as I am, but I'm doing, you know, 20 plus deals a month, 30 plus deals a month consistently. And that's just in wholesaling. And at the same time I'm doing uh, right now, I think I have 17 rehabs or spec builds going on. How does, how does somebody manage that systems? That's it. When did you make the transition from wholesaling to, you know, either acquiring rental properties or doing development or flips? Hey, hold that thought for a minute. Are you a real estate agent in the DMV area or thinking about becoming a real estate agent in the DMV area? Why not join the highest selling team in the DMV? The Carrie Scholl team is hiring more agents. We have the best training systems, the best culture, and the best environment to get you to the next level, whether that's starting out and getting to six figures or getting from six figures to 250 or to half a million or even beyond. Go to CarrieScholeCareers.com. Again, that's CarrieScholeCareers.com. Yeah, early on because Lyle was a creative investor. Lyle hated me wholesaling, by the way. He, he, did, he was not a fan of wholesaling. He was like, dude, you have a high paying job. You're not actually investing. You're just flipping contracts. You are going to regret it one day. You have to keep some of this real estate for tax reasons and for uh, just uh, uh, wealth building. And I didn't, look, I was a broke kid from Mesa, Arizona. My parents never made more than 75 grand a year, you know, and not, not saying that that's not, that was, that was successful in my world back then no millionaires in my family. And to me, to be able to do one real estate deal and make as much as an entire year as a bookkeeper was mind blowing to me. I had never come across that much money that quickly. So I was like, why would anybody do anything else other than wholesaling when I can make a million dollars a year flipping contracts with no money into the deal and no risk and I can move fast and control it all. Like, why would I want to deal with tenants and toilets and rentals and all that. that. That to me when I was young sounded really stupid. And so I didn't listen to Lyle. I just focused on wholesaling my first year. And I did, I did $1.3 million on my tax. I remember the end of my first 12 months after meeting Lyle, I stared at my tax returns and it said $1.3 million in profit. And I was like, I'm a millionaire. I'm the first millionaire in my family. Like, this is wild. And then the reality hit me that I owed $600,000 in taxes. And I about crapped my pants because I had never prepared for that because I didn't know about taxes. I didn't know about, you know, that you had to put yourself on payroll instead of just taking distributions and draws constantly. I didn't have my financial world set up the right way. My bank account set up the right way. Uh, so it took me four and a half years to unbury myself from that disaster. And my only plan was to make more money the next couple of years, which thankfully, because of real estate, I was able to. But uh, Lyle was right. And I should have listened to him. And I should have kept more of the real estate instead of letting it go. Because once I understood the tax benefits, make, making a dollar is a lot harder than keeping a dollar. And if you can keep more of the money you make instead of giving it to Uncle Sam, your business partner, uh, you're going to get a lot further over the long run. And so I just had to learn that lesson, come out the other end. And then I was like, okay, I'm adding rehabbing immediately into my business to make bigger paydays instead of selling all these for, for little wholesale fees. And one out of every seven houses or whatever, I'm going to keep, I'm going to force myself to keep it. And that was, that was the beginning of the transition to keeping more and being more of a well-rounded real estate investor. 
And Lyle taught me from day one creative financing techniques, which is really popular right now. You know, you, you're, you might have heard of people now talking again about subject to transactions and wraparound mortgages and contract for deeds and lease options and all this creative real estate investing. That was really big back in 2002, three, four, five, six. Uh, but now it's come full circle and it's, it's back around again because of where the market is shifting to and what's coming next. Everybody's starting to wake up and realize you want real estate with cheap debt on it right now. And you want to own that real estate because in the future, that's going away. There won't be houses with 3% mortgages on them anymore. Inflation is coming. The market is shifting. And when it does, these uh, appreciating rental properties with good cheap debt on it, they're going to be like gold. And you want as much of that as you possibly can get right now. You want to get it. And one of the best ways to get it is to bypass the banks. Go right to the seller and work out a deal with the seller and just say, I will give you full price for your house if you give me some terms. And if you can negotiate on terms versus negotiating on price, because everybody knows what's going on in the real estate market. They hear it on the news. They go to Zillow. They see their house is worth more than it was last, last month. They're not stupid. So why would they sell at a big discount? Most, do, you think, do you think rates are going to go higher? Yeah, absolutely. They're going to they're gonna go way higher. It might take a year or two, but it's going to go higher. It's got to go higher. Why do, why, look, the government wants uh, inflation, right? What is inflation? Purchasing power right? It's my dollar can purchase this much good, goods and services. Well, go back to the 80s. What was inflation in the 80s? 13%. We have lived in the longest period since the 90s, in the 2000s, the longest period of uh, de-escalating inflation in the last 100 years. So it's like we've lived in this great time where we haven't had to deal with inflation. Well, when the government prints $7 trillion or whatever they printed, and a large portion of that hit the banks, and what happens when banks take on deposits? They lend more money. It's called fractional lending. They lend 10 times the amount that they take in. So how do you turn 6 or $7 trillion into 60 or $70 trillion? You deposit it and then you fractionally lend out a bunch of it. So all that money has hit the, you know, 20, I think they said something like 20 or 30% of all the currency ever created was created in 2020. It might be 40%, but wow. more money was created in 2020 <laughs> yeah, than ever before. Well, that money has a price and that price is called inflation. And you're seeing it with lumber. You're seeing it with goods and services. I read an article yesterday that um, the cost of food has gone up 40% in the last four years. You know, for bananas, everything is more expensive. And then you have a global crisis with pent up demand and very little supply. That's a problem. You have the government slamming interest rates down to zero to get the economy to move, to, to compensate for all of this. You have a a ship block the Suez Canal and disrupt supply chains. I mean, think about all the things happening all at one time. Do we honestly believe that it, as Americans that we're immune to basic economics? That we're an anomaly that in, out of all the other countries in human history that had three things happen. An event occurs, the government prints money, they lower uh, interest rates and make borrowing cheaper and D, uh, GDP declines. Those three things have caused hyperinflation in almost every economy that those three things have ever happened in. Why do we think we're unique and different and special that it's not going to happen to us? Because guess what happened last year? Right? Government printed trillions, lowered interest rates, GDP declined. That's the recipe for disaster. And so I believe the government wants inflation to happen because inflation is a great debt destroyer. If you understand how it works, if you have debt, inflation eats through it. Uh, and that's why the, go the government has all this debt. It needs to deflate the debt. How does it do it? It allows inflation to, to grow. 
So right now we're at 4% or whatever they say we're at. I think it's a little bit higher than that, realistically. And I think it's going to go up to, I don't know, it might go back up to the 80s, 10, 12, 13%. We had never experienced anything like that. And will you be prepared if that happens? Most Which is, if you own homes with leverage at 3%, you're killing 100%. it. Yeah, you're you're killing it. That's the play. That's why real estate is a great hedge against the inflation. But you have to have two things. You have to have an appreciating asset, the cash flows, and you need to have good cheap debt on it. So those 3% mortgages are going to be gold in working class neighborhoods. You have to have an appreciating asset with good debt on it. That and the cash flow part makes it to where you can hold it for 10, 15 years. Is it? How, how are you doing? Uh, you, you mentioned you've got like 20 development deals going on. Are these, you know, single families, one-offs? All single deal family. deals. Yeah. So I own a company called Green Elephant Development. We're a, a for-purpose development company, meaning a portion of all our proceeds goes towards animal conservation. And uh, we raised, I put in a bunch of money. My other partners have put in a bunch of money that seeded the company. Um, and we took those few million dollars and we went and started rehabbing and buying a bunch of property. My one partner is a general contractor. My other partner is a licensed agent. So we're kind of like the dynamic trio. Um, and then we went out and raised a bunch of private money uh, and that got us to scale and um, mainly focused here in Arizona. Although we do have some investments in Tennessee and the Dakotas and Vegas, but mainly here in Arizona. And so we, we do your bread and butter renovations, right? Um, a lot of three, four, five hundred thousand dollar houses we buy for, let's just call it 400,000, put a hundred grand into it and sell for 650 or whatever it is in uh, 600, somewhere right around there. And by the time we back out everything, we're making 40, 50, 60, 70 K we do a lot of those. Uh, and then we do uh, a lot of spec builds in Arcadia, which is, one of the best zip codes here in Arizona, very high demand, three to 4,000 square foot new builds where we buy a house, tear it down, build a new three or 4,000 square foot house. And those ones go from anywhere from two to three and a half million dollars on the back end. And so, you're, you're teaching all of this wholesaling to, to hundreds of, of thousands of people or, or what, what parts of what you do are you teaching everything? All of it. All of it. Yeah, uh, I, I'm very lucky. I mean, I've had probably over 100,000 people come through my program. And uh, most of them, you know, are new, newer, uh, I would say probably 75% are new or 25% are more experienced. And it really depends on where you're at in your journey. But um, the more experienced people, we put them in our masterminds, we bring them out to our projects, we help them with systems and scaling and lead generation and the new people. It's just about getting to their first couple deals, really just learning the language of real estate, learning the business, having that mentorship for that first year to, to just get results and get in the game and get comfortable. Uh, yeah, so we have different, different things for different people. My favorite thing I have going on right now, though, honestly, is more done for you stuff. What I've discovered is uh, most people don't want to do a lot of the stuff that I'm doing. So for instance, imagine if I came into your business and I set up your entire technology platform. I created, I did all the one-click integrations. I grabbed all your local real estate contracts, got them all, you know, perfected, got them into the system. So that way you can send out DocuSign type contracts out for e-signature. Um, I pull, I do your market research. I pull your data for you. I skip trace your data for you. I hire a VA for you. I train the VA. I hire the cold callers for you. I train the cold callers. We give them the data. We manage them for 90 days, right? And we basically do all of the businessy crap that nobody really wants to do. And just every day, we're just teeing you up with sellers that say, I'm interested in getting an offer. And so you just, your phone's like ding, 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 ding. Oh, I got a new motivated seller lead. I got a new lead. I got a new lead. Now, now all you do, and then I mentor you over the next six months to take those yeses, like, yes, I'm interested in getting an offer and working the leads. So you don't have to think about hiring and training and managing and data and integrations and tech and all that. We do all that. 
that's the real future where I'm driving because that's sexy to me. That's new and unique. And I found from the investors I do that for, uh, they love it. They love it. Cause they're like, now I'm a real estate investor. I, I'm not really a business owner. I'm not really an entrepreneur. I just get to do the fun part of the business, which is the real estate part. And they have me in their corner, coaching them along how to negotiate, how to, you know, do creative deal structuring and make offers and all that and how to raise money. And uh, if they want to get into rehabbing, I could teach them the rehabbing side of the business. And uh, I feel over the next two years, most of my education and mentorship is going to transition to more of the done for you stuff. Wow. That's uh, Cody. This has been amazing. I mean, you've got such a great story coming from quartermaster in the Navy to, you know, mega real estate wholesaler, developer, teacher. It's been very inspiring, very, um, you know, inspirational to, to listen to this. I know all our listeners are going to feel the same way. I always end with a hyper fast round. If you're ready for some rapid fire questions and answers. Hit me, Dan. Let's go. All right. What's your biggest piece of advice to a new real estate investor? Don't overthink it. Move fast. Uh, money loves speed. And uh, you don't have to have it perfect, but you do got to take massive action and, and, and go. You'll learn more on the job than you ever will from watching Cody Sperber YouTube videos. All right. What, a, what about a, a real estate agent? What would you tell a new real estate agent? Find, find a team to get plugged into that will provide uh, lead gen and great training. Uh, same thing. Uh, don't be a, a whiny little baby agent. Go sit the open houses, go work the crowd, put yourself out there. You got to be aggressive. It's not going to come to you. It's not like the field of dreams where you build a website and everybody's just going to show up and give you business. You got to go fight for it. And the best way to do that is to be a servant for your first year, find that killer in the business that's, that's dominating and work your way up, sit every open house, get their laundry, get their you know, do all the BS work that they don't want to do, write their contracts, do their cleanup work, whatever it takes to get proximity to that person, because they're going to unlock the key to the next level. Because what's going to happen is one of these days, you're going to get that lead, that million dollar listing lead or something like that, that on their own, they're never going to hire you because you're not credible. You don't have any deal flow. You've never done this before, but you're going to be able to leverage that more successful person's business and reputation and bring them in on the deal with you. You only need one or two great deals to happen before you're now you can go off on your own and, and you're gonna uh, be able to stand on your own. So that's what I would do if I was uh, trying to dominate as an agent in a very tough world to be an agent in right now because there's a gazillion agents and very few opportunities. So you gotta be aggressive. What's the, the most common mistake you see experienced real estate investors make? So people that are you know, have some success and, and have been doing it for a while. What are they messing up? Um, probably the most common thing I see is, you know, it, they just get stuck in their ways and they don't want to innovate any longer. They're not as motivated as they used to be because they do have a little bit of success and a little bit of money. You got to keep that hunger alive and you have to constantly evolve or you're going to evaporate. Like you really got to be, the, the world is changing very quickly nowadays. Um, I'm, I'm all about using the latest and greatest technology to beat your competition uh, to the deal. So don't be afraid to evolve and don't get stuck in your ways. You gotta, you gotta, I stay, I, the way I stay with my finger on the pulse is I surround myself with a lot of youthful enthusiasm and the young people out there, they're the ones that are coming up with all the cool hip things to do. So I always keep my ear to the street, keep those people kind of close to me. And when I see something that's kind of evolving or growing, I, uh, I force myself to, uh, learn that as well. What's something you're doing today in your business that you weren't doing a year ago? Hmm. Oh, that is a great question. Uh, probably I'm using more smart data than I ever have before. A lot of artificial intelligence algorithms and stuff to like really take the data that I have and turn it from big data into smart data probably what I'm doing most of that's new and unique and cool. Uh, I got lucky. I, I, I met a data scientist that turned me on to this, this concept of using artificial intelligence to create propensity and probability models on my, my data, which basically is like a, a, a score, like almost like a credit score. 
So I can take all the homeowners in say Phoenix, Arizona, and I can score them on which ones have the highest probability and propensity for selling at a discount within the next 90 days. And now I can hyper-target my marketing and not waste money advertising to people that probably wouldn't sell, especially within a certain period of time. You got to understand there is millions and millions and millions of data points out there. We're being tracked on every single level. They know what our spending habits are, what our browser habits are, whether or not we're in a lawsuit or have medical issues. I mean, there's so much data out there on the hu humans and human behavior. If you think that there's not smart data tracking you right now, trying to figure out what advertising to show you, your, your head is buried in the sand. And we're just starting to use that technology for real estate on how to get out in front. You know, how do I get my Facebook ad to show up in your inbox or show up on your feed in, in, when uh, most of my competition doesn't even know you exist, but I'm advertising to you already because the algorithm showed me based on what's going on on these millions of data points that might not be today, but within the next 90 days, you're going to hit this wall of wanting to sell. How great would it be to have that kind of crystal ball? So we're working on those kind of algorithms right now to, to refine them. And they are working. You know, we're getting a handful of my most profitable deals every month are coming from AI. Wow. What's, uh, what, what's the, the, the most, the, or what's the thing we would see you most likely doing when you're not working on your business? Hanging out with the kids, fam. Uh, yeah, I'm, you know, it's tough because I have five or six pretty large companies that I run now. So I don't have a ton of free time, but when I am, uh, there's probably uh, chips and guacamole and a margarita in my hand. And I'm probably in Cabo somewhere enjoying some, you know, reset time with the family. I love traveling with my kids. Uh, and that's the best part about being a real estate investor. When I love what I'm doing so much that I never want to take a vacation. But if I ever feel that I just need a break or I need something, I don't have to ask anybody permission. It doesn't matter if it's a Tuesday. I just call my wife, hey, get the kids, we're out. And uh, to be able to just have that kind of control has been uh, probably the greatest reward of being a successful investor. All right, last one. Where do you see yourself 10 years from now? Uh, doing this, doing this. I love what I do. Like I said, I wouldn't want to do anything else. This is it. I wish I had a better answer. This is it. You're going to see me. I, I'll Perfect. probably be a little balder, a, a little older and, uh, still doing this. And, and that's just cause I, I don't do this cause I need to do this. I do this cause I love to do this. And when that feeling goes away, I'm out. But as long as it's still here, I'm going to keep on cranking because there's not a day that goes by. I don't get a, a DM or a screenshot or a picture from some of one of my students or multiple of my students cash in a check, quitting their job, proposing to their wife, live in the dream. And it reminds me on a daily basis why I do what I do, because there's no greater gift in the world or job in the world that uh, you can do uh, than one that impacts others and real estate will do that for you. So let's keep on doing it. All right, Cody, this has been amazing. If people want to connect with you or learn about the programs you have, what are the best ways for them to do that? At Clever Investor on all social platforms. Uh, you can go to cleverinvestor.com and my latest greatest training that I put out, I'm very excited over. It's called the free house formula. Go to freehouseformula.com. You can check it out. It's basically how to get free houses using creative financing techniques like we kind of talked about a little bit. My students are loving it. They say that it's the best training I ever put out. So you want to go check that out. It's freehouseformula.com. All right. Check out freehouseformula.com. Thank you so much, Cody. Thank you, everyone else who listened and, and watch this. Uh, I know Cody brought so much value. So please remember to hit that share button so more people can see it. Thank you. And we'll see you next time. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Hyper Fat Show. Subscribe to us if you want to make sure you get the latest and greatest Hyper Fat Shows. And remember, we love reviews. Reviews help us bring better and better guests, improve our shows, and give us the good, the bad, and the ugly. We hope you enjoyed the show, and we will see you next time.
Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end. I hope you enjoyed that video, and if you wanna see more, click right here. And if you want 100 real estate tips from my best-selling book, click right here to download them instantly. And if you're new to this channel, click below to subscribe and turn on post notifications so you don't miss out. And leave some comments about what you think on the videos. 